Hello, I'm Jeff Stairs. Welcome to this week's edition of Community College News, news for all six MBCC campuses. Today we'll look at technology and education, health, and some current events like the Occupy movement and Fundy's bids for the Seven Natural Wonders contest. But first, midterms are approaching. If you haven't already written an exam, then you likely will be soon. Kyle DuPont has more on distractions we all face while trying to study. Computers and the internet are unique tools for learning. But these tools can also be distracting. Internet savvy students may have trouble concentrating when trying to study. Noise. Can't work in an environment that is not friendly to studying or easily distracting. Facebook and cell phones and TV. But my kids are a big one. It's tempting to go on and get away from the work sometimes. Just get distracted. Many students have a misconception about studying. Valerie Phillips organized an Atlantic Province Association of Communication Teachers Conference. It explored media multitasking, a term associated with the use of computers and the internet. The, that's kind of a myth, uh, that whole multitasking idea. Phillips says the idea of media multitasking takes away from our ability to focus. If you can set aside all distractions, your ability to retain information will increase you need to shut off all the other distractions and even your phones and, and all of that and focus on, on a subject for, you know, 20, even 20 minutes. UMB professor of education Ellen Rose says we break up our limited attention resources into smaller pieces when media multitasking. Rose says eliminating distractions and our compulsion to be connected, you can accomplish more. In Woodstock, Kyle DuPont, Community College News. Cell phones are not only for calling people these days. Many are now using them for educational purposes. Jill Constantine looks at how phones are being integrated into the education system. Cell phones are usually seen as a nuisance in the classroom, but things are changing. Companies are now creating cell phone apps designed for learning. Many students are in favor of using their phones as a resource in the classroom. I have one of the apps that we were, um, it was suggested to us to buy and it was kind of expensive but I know it's a huge help and it's a huge time saver other than have to flip through hundreds and hundreds of pages. You just type one thing in and it's there. For educational purposes I don't see a problem but you know I think for other reasons they probably should be turned off. Because it's like using a computer if you have a smartphone go on the internet and look up stuff. It's a lot quicker if you have it in your pocket. You don't have to go sit down in front of the computer. Nursing instructor Nicole Crusett uses Nursing Central. She believes that the app is a great tool for her students. And very quickly look, what is this for? You know, how, what's the dose they should be on? And it's right there at their fingertips. And it's tiny. They can carry that in their pockets all the time. Um, I really, really strongly would recommend my students to have that app. Crusett thinks that the app is a great learning resource. Other teachers are also finding value with having cell phones in the classroom, but it may be a while before we see such acceptance with everyone in the teaching community. In Woodstock, Jill Constantine, Community College News. Eating healthy can be expensive. For students who are already on a limited budget, it can be much more difficult. Tony Bourgeois sees how students are finding ways to keep the grocery bill low without compromising health. For many students, what's for dinner is what's fast and cheap. And for the most part, it is not the healthiest of food. Honestly, I don't think I'm a healthy eater. I don't really get the money to buy a lot of healthy food, so I just usually eat TV dinners and... Just cost, just more of like uh, accessibility, you know? I'd rather grab something I can quickly throw in the microwave than something that's going to take me half an hour to cook. The healthier, fresher foods are the ones that can cost more at the grocery store. Some students will not buy the healthy foods. They say the risk the food will spoil before they can eat it is just too high. Wendy Cummings says healthy choices begin with nutrition awareness. I've been really working on cooking classes here to educate people to be able to say, what can I have that's cheap and inexpensive? Cummings believes most food can be split up into two categories, real food and consumable product. Edible products are foods with high calories that don't really do much for your body. Real food is exactly what your body needs. Cummings also believes that some foods you're likely to crave just are not so good for you. 
I think I'd have to say the biggest culprit for disease and illness and uh, breaking down your immune system is sugar. Kelly says it's important to find alternatives to sugary snacks. A chocolate bar can cost a dollar each, when an apple or a banana can cost as low as 50 cents. In Woodstock, Tony Bourgeois, Community College News. Not every student has enough cash in hand to buy fruits and vegetables. One NBCC campus is promoting healthy eating this week by giving away a nutritional snack. Woodstock's campus is giving students free apples. The apples are a healthy alternative to some of the quick but less healthy foods available. Students a lot of time are stretched for money and a lot of them probably aren't eating properly so we thought hey if we can help them out you know one day to put something healthy in their tummies and a smile on their face then we've done a good job that day. The apples are free all day. Students can talk to their SRC representative about healthy food programs on campus. A stress management seminar was held this week at MBCC Woodstock. Students were taught methods for coping with stressful situations in the college experience. If you or someone you know could use advice, contact your campus's counseling services. Last week, we talked about the student executive elections. MBCC's new Council of Student Executives met for the first time in Fredericton. From student loans to new health and dental discussions, issues that could affect all students were discussed. Officer Square in downtown Fredericton was the site of 12 Hours for the Homeless, a fundraiser in support of Chrysalis House. Julie Gallant-Daigle explains why the event was held to help the not-for-profit organization. First and foremost, raise awareness of youth homelessness in the, in the community, as well as to um, raise much needed funds for Chrysalis House. Um, Chrysalis House is a home for homeless and at-risk female youth ages 16 to 19. The annual event attracted more than 50 teams. Fundraisers stayed in cardboard shelters for 12 hours, getting a small taste of what being homeless could be like. About 250 people in Moncton took to the square outside City Hall on Saturday. The gathering was to show solidarity with the month-old Occupy Wall Street protests in New York. Occupy Moncton organizer Katya McAvoy says the movement's popularity shows more people want open communication with their governments. I think the Occupy movement is a chance to get a revolution, to get things changed. There are today, up to date, uh, 1,666 uh, cities in the world that are doing this. Uh, there is places that, like Wall Street that have been doing it for 29 days today. So I think that it's the opportunity to start getting a dialogue with our governments. Protesters in Moncton remained peaceful. Similar events took place in Fredericton and St. John. New Brunswick Premier David Allward and Prime Minister Stephen Harper are supporting a bid to have the Bay of Fundy named one of the world's seven natural wonders. The Bay of Fundy is known for the highest tides in the world. In some places, tides rise more than 15 meters. Here in New Brunswick, tourists and adventure seekers alike visit the shores of the Bay at Hopewell Rocks. Voting is taking place online at sevennaturalwonders.org. The deadline for voting is November 11th. Pantene, Dove, and Axe, all common household names for soaps and shampoos. What most consumers don't know is that these good-smelling hygiene products could be adding to water pollution. Jocelyn Turner has more. Everyday soaps and shampoos are adding more toxins to our water supply, said a report published on David Suzuki's website. One of the ingredients in shampoos and soaps is sodium lauryl sulfate. The International Agency for Research on Cancer says the chemical may cause cancer. But the Government of Canada says the amount of the chemical in soaps and shampoos is probably too low to have any effect. Rishma Glynn says she has not washed her hair with commercial soaps in over a month. She says she uses all natural soaps to wash. Yes, there are. There are all kinds of preservatives and everything like that in it, but also parabens and SLS, a sodium lauryl sulfate, which has been known to be detrimental to our health, and parabens have actually been said by some to be carcinogens, cancer-causing agents. Uh, this is the Meduxnakeg River flowing up. Simon Mitchell of the Meduxnakeg River Association says consumers should be more aware of what they are using as cleaners and soaps. He says consumers can do a few things to keep water clean. Well, certainly uh, one of the main precautions is uh, minimizing the inputs of these uh, chemicals, whether they be soaps or cleaning solvents or, or what have you. 
Um, the, the first step is, is reduction. The second step uh, is switching to a, to a biodegradable uh, soap, although those still can contain organics which um, uh, don't break down in the, in the system very well. The Conservation Council says some products are eco-friendly. Well, I think with shampoos, you need to look for um, reliable and soaps, reliable labeling. Uh, in the Canadian con context, the only reliable label is the eco logo label. Um, the eco label, eco logo label means that the product has met uh, uh, specific criteria and standards established um, um, for uh, for uh, the eco logo program. It uh, was a program initiated by the federal government that is administered by a private firm now, but um, it, uh, it's very transparent, so you can go on and look at exactly what requirements that soap or shampoo had to meet to achieve EcoLogo uh, labeling. Um, and EcoLogo, for people who aren't familiar with it, looks like sort of three doves squashed together uh, with a maple leaf. <laughs> Consumers can check the back of the bottle. This list of ingredients can show you exactly what's going down the drain and potentially into our drinking water. In Woodstock, Jocelyn Turner, Community College News. The carpentry class in Woodstock built practice footings this week. The electrical students are using the footings to install a temporary electrical service. The project is designed to make trade students work together. That's our show for today. To submit a story idea, email us at jschoolmbcc at gmail.com. To see more of our work, visit jschoolmbcc.ca. Thanks for watching.